to you. Can you all hear me? I can't hear you. You can hear me now. Tried to get all this stuff set up before I set up in here in the room, and so it can be ready when we start. But it didn't work that way. So here I am on the phone again. So good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing? Good. Just good. It's what you supposed to say, he will. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Thursday. I'm all right. Mm. Well, Right, Jane, you made it. I'm gonna try to do this thing a couple more minutes to load. I thought I'd show off the um, the view from my back patio at home today. <laughs> Some sightseeing. Well, that's nice. I show you mine, but it'll be a bunch of houses. It's hard to see, but there's there is a house that sort of gets in the way over that way. <laughs> it's like the only two story in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Okay. How's everybody enjoying the wind? <laughs> I'm not. Okay. We'll get started as this thing is still loading. Um, welcome everybody. Today's Thursday, April 28th, 2022. And we're here to talk about the current COVID status for the Pueblo. I'm Troy. And the rest of the team is on. If you guys want to say who you are. Rebecca oh. Jolin, Tribal Public Health Nurse. Raylene Martinez, um, Diabetes Program Assistant. Welcome, Dama Gonzalez, CHR. Claudia Lynn, TCHR Generalist. Uh, Ladon Yazi, Tribal Public Health Educator. Yes, eh. Good morning, good afternoon. Hi, Toy. It's good to see you. Hi. Are we introducing today. ourselves? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm Victoria Martinez, Healthy Kids, Healthy Community Coordinator. Perfect. Um, so, as many of you have probably heard on the on the blast recently, 
Um, the Pueblo has reopened. We're in phase three of the reopening, which is good, good news. Yay, yay. Which basically means that we have zero cases or we have a low case count. Uh, and it's pretty much under control. And we aren't having to deal with a lot of the case issues that we had um, in the past. We are at zero cases right now. We haven't had any cases in a couple of weeks. And um, looks like we are moving forward with uh, returning to normal as or as best as normal operations, which is, you know, obviously good news for the community. Um, and I have I don't know how to put these things up here with uh, okay, it's not working we um, even though we are at zero cases and the Pueblo has had no cases in the past couple of weeks we still have to look at what is going on around us and what's going on in the state to make sure that we stay careful and vigilant um, around COVID. Um, I think if any of you have looked at the recent, most recent um, COVID case dashboard for the New Mexico Department of Health, you'll notice that the northern part of the state is pretty much the only part of the state that has high transmission rate compared to the rest of the state. Um, Everyone else is either moderate, and I think there's one county, Donion County, which is surprising, is actually considered low transmission rate, and they're usually pretty high or have been pretty high throughout the pandemic, uh, but they're actually considered low transmission rate. But Santa Fe County, Rio Riva County, and Los Alamos County are still considered high transmission rates. So even though we are at zero cases, we have to continue to look at uh, ways to keep um, ourselves in the community protected by um, following the most the, the best COVID safe practices and keeping our um, keeping our exposures and case counts low so um, trying to get this to open here again you know that the computers back up it's always nice to have visuals so I wanted to do that today. Uncomfortable silence. It's great. Well, um, I could talk a little bit about the current status of the U.S. Um, where we are seeing a slight increase of cases in April, um, although trends in uh, mortality are kind of headed downwards, um, we are still seeing hospitalizations. So um, I think that the work that we've done, um, that everyone's done here, um, not just uh, health and human service, but the entire community on keeping each other safe um, has been really uh, as a testament to the hard work of people that we don't have, uh, you know, uh, current cases and um, infections going on. So we just got to keep up the good work. And, um, you know, even though we're opening more and more um we still want to stay vigilant like troy said and there's our more uh state look go ahead troy so if you look at the the map um a kind of circle santa fe county um red basically means that uh, it's high transmission rate so our county and all the counties around us are are still in the upper level of trans high transmission that little red arrow kind of pointing at where we specifically are in the county um usually uh, it takes a little time this is obviously a uh the case transmission rate up to april 25th so there's uh, a little bit of a lag with um where these numbers are um for the state and if you look at 
you know, the, the, the nationwide numbers over the last 24 hours, you know, you're still averaging 800 deaths a day and 88,000 cases a day, which is not that bad considering if you look just below that, your, your record high for cases per day is over 1 million and record number of de deaths each day is over 4,000. Um, but the nationwide numbers basically shows you how serious the pandemic actually has been since the beginning. You're talking 81 million cases since the beginning of the pandemic for the entire country. And what's been all over the news recently about how um, we really need to really, even though the numbers are getting are, are low, we really need to, cons to, to consider what uh, we've seen in this country around COVID deaths. Um, we're, we're quickly approaching 1 million deaths from COVID-19 in the country. So as you can see on the screen, 992,000 cases of, or uh, deaths from COVID-19, which is um, a really, really difficult number to have to look at, you know, when we're looking at um, the country uh, and the number we've lost from this virus. And so uh, just a little bit of a reminder to keep your, um, your vigilance level high and, you know, if you're eligible for vaccinations, um, vaccinated and get boosted and uh, try to stay safe as possible. And, and if, if you all remember in the beginning of the pandemic, they were talking about a way to reach herd immunity in the country, which they say really isn't necessarily possible at this point, um, considering the uh, number of, of uh, cases and as quickly as this, this virus keeps mutating. Um, they were saying that we needed to reach nationwide for the entire population, 75% vaccination rate. As you can see in the bottom, we're only at 66.62% for the country. So whether we're at a high vaccination rate here in the in the, the, the Pueblo or in the state of New Mexico, the virus survives because it continues to have hosts to, um, to, um, to infect. And as long as we have folks who are not vaccinated, uh, we're going to continue to have challenges with um, mutating mutations of the virus and different variants that are showing up, not just from other countries, but also from um, uh, communities in, this, in, the, in the United States that are having high uh, infection rates. So um, I just want to kind of give that visual because it's important uh, to see, even though we are at zero, what does the state look like and what does the country look like as far as cases are concerned? And just to make sure everybody is, is able to re recognize that this is still a pandemic. It's still a difficult um, uh, situation that we continue to be in. And, you know, I don't know if any of you saw Fa Dr. Fauci on news yesterday <laughs> saying that we are no longer in the pandemic stage of, 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 of COVID, the United States. And, uh, you know, he he may be looking at certain uh, variables of the vac of the virus, but I don't think he's necessarily uh, n communicating that information, you know, well enough for people to understand it. Because we do have individuals who are still immunocompromised. We do have individuals who are still having um, challenges uh, with how they're dealing with COVID nineteen, um, with whatever medical conditions they might have that might be putting them at risk. So just wanted to put that up there. I don't know if anybody has any questions or any other team has anything to add to that. Yeah. Um, one of the things, you know, in working in public health, one of the things that I've encountered with folks like, um, you know, uh, Dr. Walensky and Dr. Fauci when speaking on topics of the pandemic is a lot of times, you know, they speak for enormous populations and um it's not always um they're not always considering each and every community's individual situations so i've learned to um take some of that and and, and synthesize it with the idea that um that, you know, it's important that we consider where we live and how we live and um, and the importance of, of others in our families and in our communities and how, how we uh, behave around that. So um, 
advice coming from those folks is great, but um, we also just want to keep in mind, um, you know, the folks that are immunocompromised and they may not be the majority, but they're still important. Um, so I can appreciate that as well. It seems like my computer's up now. Hooray. So anyone who's watching, does anybody have any questions or comments on that? Oh, that was turned all the way up. That's why it was so loud. I just wanted to add that um, the CDC the CDC provides us with these um, COVID-19 um, news alerts. And so I received one this morning. Can you hear me? Okay. And so reading through it, um, the, for the United States, this is just something that we should be aware of. The CDC reported that as of April 20th, um, the seven-day moving average for the daily cases of COVID cases increased by 35 percent. The last time we had a conversation it it was it increased by 19 percent so it's so just to be aware just to um, provide you with that information we want to be careful and cautious and be aware um, and, and just um, be vigilant that's that's what I wanted to share was to, just the news alert that was provided to me is something I'm sharing and passing along. Well, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about is is the the, the current predictions, the current um, forecasts for COVID nineteen, and I saw something pretty um, disturbing coming out of CDC yesterday uh, around the, the predictions for COVID, um, COVID COVID numbers over the next two weeks, as a matter of fact, and the, the forecast is indicating from the CDC that we may have an increase in the country of, of up to 100% in COVID cases. So I think, like we we're talking earlier, is about 40,000 cases a day, 45,000 cases a day. They are talking that within the next two weeks, there's a possibility by May 3rd, that we um, could be at 80,000 cases a day. And if you think about that, that's almost double what we have now. So those are the, the numbers we need to start looking at, not what has happened in the past. We need to look at what the what could happen in the future if we don't control or manage um, our exposure rates, um, watch our uh, uh, exposure controls and testing um regularly to make sure that if we have symptoms or if we think that we've been exposed to make sure we catch it early um that's that's really important to make sure that we we pay attention to because you know we have uh you know for for some people they consider us having the luxury of of having um maintain low case counts for a while but as we talked about in a few reports previously um there is an expectation that there's going to be a spike here soon and what they're saying um in their in their most recent forecast that's basically in line with what they're talking about it sounds like it's coming a little earlier than what was expected but um it doesn't mean that it's 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 um you know that they were incorrect it just means that as communities start opening up as mask mandates start to be dropped as uh, things that are that have been known to work to prevent COVID-19 are starting to be reduced, we are going to start having some spikes and hopefully it just levels out and doesn't spike to the point where we have another major outbreak. But those are those are some of the some of the things that we need to take into consideration. Um, but 100 percent increase is a pretty significant jump in cases. I don't care um where you are in the world that's a that's a that's a big number um so any questions or comments on that (laughs) 
So yeah, really, I, I was actually I had that was on my list to talk about um, about Moderna's uh, EUA request to the FDA. So uh, as most of you have known in the past, the Pfizer submitted a, a request for EUA authorization uh, for a vaccine for individuals under the age of five uh, a couple of months ago, and they're still waiting for a response. In fact, um, the most recent update is that they're expecting that approval to come in June. So uh, from six months to five years old for Pfizer, they're expecting that um, they're expecting an approval for vaccines for those individuals. But just this morning, uh, Moderna reported that they submitted a new EUA emergency use authorization authorization for a vaccination for the ages of six months to six years old, because, as you know, um, Moderna's uh, current vaccination is six and older and Pfizer's vaccination is five and older. So that's why there's a difference in um, the age, uh, the, the ages that they're requesting authorization for. So if this goes through the way that it's expected to, um, we will be able to have basically have vaccinations for the entire population that's um, really at risk, you know, within the next couple of months between June, you know, June and July. So. Um, of course, that means we're going to be reaching out to you all again <laughs> to talk about, you know, who do you have in your household that may need to be vaccinated so we can get them on the list so they can get vaccinated. Um, that's important to to pay attention to. Um, but that's it's good news for some. Um, but it's, it's so for some they're you know, they're saying it's why is it taking so long? Because we are having a, an increase in cases uh, in the pediatric population, those under the age of six across the country, including hospitalizations. Uh, so, um, but like we talked about before, the virus and most most communicable diseases, viruses that are spread, you know, from person to person, you know, when one um, piece of the population is not available for infection, it goes to the most accessible. And right now because we have so many folks under the age of six that are not vaccinated um that's why we're having an increase in cases in that age group so if you have any children grandchildren family members who are under the age of five, uh, six or five um look out for the the announcement that those vaccines are going to be available it's important to understand that that's coming um, in addition to that, uh, there is, there was FDA also approved yesterday, um, new treatment for, uh, children who get COVID-19 and, uh, there's not a lot of information about it yet. Uh, but there, so if you do have a child who does get, um, COVID-19 under the age of 12, you can start asking for similar to what the adults are getting right now, different types of uh, treatments once they get back, once they get infected with COVID, there is an option now. Uh, I don't know if it's available with IHS, but I wanted to address that because it was in the news yesterday and it's probably going to be in the news more as days go by. And just in case people have questions, um, you know, just, you know, ask your doctor about it, your pediatrician about it, because it is now available for pediatric patients who uh, happen to contract COVID. And while we're on a topic of COVID treatments, I just wanted to put this up. Uh, this is something from the New Mexico Department of Health that talks about the different types of treatments that are available for COVID-19 and those individuals who should consider looking at these treatments if they were to get COVID-19. If you look at the different conditions um, that a person uh, may be diagnosed with that puts them at high risk of serious illness, um, <laughs> you see how large that list is. You know, things as little as substance use or if you smoke, if you're either a smoker now or you were a smoker in the past, or if you have uh, challenges with obesity or you're overweight, um, you're talking, that's that's basically 60% of the country. So um, just wanted to put that up so people know what's available. There's the oral medicines, the pills that are there. They have the, um, and also have the IV um, um, form of the monoclonal antibody treatments that are available. So um, that's important to know that there is treatment. 
because we have had a lot of focus on vaccinations and prevention. But we also need to understand that people will still get COVID. So what's available for the community and folks who do get COVID if they are start having symptoms? Well, these are the different types of medications that are available. Uh, most places will require it to be within five days of your symptoms showing for you to be eligible to have these treatments. But uh, there are some exceptions for those some individuals who um, are having a, a longer um, onset or a longer, um, the, the, the virus is staying in the body a lot longer because you know how we test test out here in the, in the Pueblo and after five days you can test out of, it, of isolation. If after 10 days you're still symptomatic and you're still testing positive, um, there are options, you know, um, you can contact IHS and see if they'd make an exception to receiving these medications because um, it means that your system's having a hard time um, processing that virus out of the system. So uh, these are options right here. I just wanted to make sure I put that up. Everything else on that, Rebecca? No, this is a really good sheet, though, to, that talks about that. Um, you know, also, uh, and anyone who has had COVID um, and is feeling differently, more tired, um, having trouble focusing, things like that, um, you know, bear in mind that long COVID is a real, it's a real thing. So, um, you know, if you need assistance with that, don't forget to... Uh, schedule an appointment with your doctor or, um, you know, you can feel free to ask us questions um, and uh, make sure that you get the attention that you need because uh, returning to returning to normal activity can be challenging. Um, so you want to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, we want to reiterate the fact that um, after COVID, because of what COVID does to the body, especially to the different organs in the body, it is very important that you go see your doctor after you had COVID, because there are a lot of long COVID um, cases out there where people who are experiencing symptoms of COVID long after they've what you know clinically referred to as recovered from the virus. So you're no longer testing positive, but there's a lot of folks um, who are still experiencing many of the, the symptoms related to COVID. Most are, are talking about um, fatigue and brain fog and uh, still having shortness of breath and not being able to perform certain activities um, after after having COVID. And that is you know those are that's the definition of of long COVID. if it's it's 30 days or more after you have uh so-called recovered from COVID, you're still experiencing symptoms um you are really needing to try to check in with your doctor uh, to see if there's anything that they can do to help with that the other part of this is that there are individuals who had COVID, who were asymptomatic they had absolutely zero symptoms who are going to the doctor and notice and, re and, and the doctor is telling them based on um, their uh, physical blood results, things like that, that there are some things that have changed in their systems as a result of having COVID. One of the big ones um, that we as a department deal with all the time is diabetes. Folks who had absolutely no uh, challenges with blood glucose or A1C after COVID, they are uh, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or they are um, considered what some folks refer to as pre-diabetic, which means your, your, your fasting blood glucose is over a certain uh, number, right around 100, um, and uh, you have a, an elevated A1C, which wasn't there before. I actually know of a person who had a an A1C of 5.2 prior to having COVID, and now his A1C is a, is a nine, and that's that's it's a pretty significant jump. And they're saying that because COVID affects the pancreas so significantly, um, 
uh, the beta cells in the, in the pancreas, that that's the reason why there are individuals who are uh, uh, having challenges with their blood sugar or being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes after the fact. Now, some of some of the folks, it's short term, but others, it's, you know, there's individuals who had COVID in 2019 and 2020 who are now insulin dependent because of COVID. Now, you know, can you stop the damage that COVID did, did by going to the doctor? Well, no, but guess what? If you catch it early, um, there is a possibility that there's some treatment that they can give you to kind of reverse the effects. Uh, so I know that sounds kind of scary, but it is it is a reality of what we're dealing with with this virus. It does attack and many times damage um, certain organs in our body. So um, that is why in many cases, some people live with symptoms of long COVID. So that's, I should move on from that though. We do have Did you have something with Donna? I know you had unmuted early earlier. No. Can you No, I was just really um gonna bring up how um I think I mentioned this before that um, my area of um, public health is really focused on nutrition and previous or during the pandemic there wasn't a lot of information on the, the foods or anything there was really nothing about COVID and nutrition and so now when I'm looking at um, research and information for example I'm looking at osteopor osteoporosis and arthritis um, there's research that's coming up that is really that's focused on how COVID impacts each of these illnesses or how it, you know it's there's um just really information out there so I'm sure down the road we'll be learning more about these different illnesses and how COVID COVID-19 has impacted um people and like you said how it's really um really increasing chances um, chronic illnesses. It's um, really not good for the body. It's really not, um, it's not good. So just really being prepared, aware, knowledgeable, um, and doing your best to um, take care of yourself and consider some of the information provided Usually people say, well, this is not healthy. Um, um, physical fitness is important. Some, sometimes we want to know why we want those answers. Um, why, why is vitamin D good for your bones? How is it good for your bones? How is calcium good for your bones? And some of those answers um, I'd like to provide, but um, it would also be um, some conversations we could have down the road, just providing that information. So for a whole team of um, um, health and human service um, providers, I mean, we're providing that service. So if you have questions, reach out. I'm always um, happy to work and talk with individuals about nutrition and education. That was all I was gonna add. Just there's up, up and coming research and I'll do my best to provide that information down the road. We just probably shouldn't focus so much on the survival or mortality rate of COVID. Uh, that's not the most significant piece of this. Yes, people are pat are dying from this virus, but uh, those who are surviving, even if they have no symptoms, we're actually, you know, having we're going to have a new um, epidemic of issues, uh, which are related to uh, individuals who have had COVID who will survive, but have now now have issues with um with uh, their health especially with chronic health conditions so um so i wanted to bring up the fact that we are we are still having our i'll let i'll let uh Thelma talk about this well geez, thank you troy <laughs> so um we've been giving out um, 
gift cards for those who have been vaccinated, who have their third um, vaccine. And we've had a couple of uh, drive through and some people have been picking up at our office. All we need to do is either you can send us a copy of your vaccine card. Um, I believe the information is listed below where you can send it. You can either text it to the number um, 252-5986 or you can go ahead and email it um, to COVID at org. We just need a copy of that and just let us know if you'd like to mail it. Um, we can mail it out or you can come and pick it up if you live closer. Um, those are it's very important and i just want to thank everybody for doing their part for the pueblo and not only for the pueblo but for yourself and for the community for for getting vaccinated it's very important and um you know we all should feel happy about that and it's just something that you know the tribe decided again to do for just letting you know thank you very much and um, and if you aren't sure and you don't remember the numbers, you can either send it to Rayleigh, myself, or Claudia as well. Email it or just text it to us, the pictures. And if you have any questions, just give us a call. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And I needed to add, you also have to be a tribal member here um, in Sanai. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. <laughs> That's quite loud. Sorry. I think it's that background music. No, I have a second screen up. And it's giving back, it's giving back feedback. So let's close that. Okay. So that's, it's important, you know, we have, we've gotten these gift cards for folks to uh, be able to, you know, get some appreciation from the administration and from the COVID response team, you know, for committee members who have gotten their vaccinations and their boosters is in, and we still have cards. They're still sitting here. Some of those folks who have not yet claimed them. Uh, so if you haven't claimed yours, or if you know a community member who has not claimed theirs and they need to, to, uh, to get their, their, uh, their card, please contact us. You know, the five, five, or sorry, five, oh, five, two, five, two, five, nine, eight, six number is the best number to call. Someone will answer it. Someone will be able to answer your questions about it. But these, um, you know, this is uh, this is uh, a, a, an incentive to, you know, express our pr appreciation for doing your part to protect the community. So it's there and it's available. No questions asked. All we need is a copy of your vaccination card, and know that you are an enrolled member of San I Pueblo. So contact us. And we are in, in, in the works of scheduling a, we don't have a flyer made yet. We don't have any fancy uh, railing, um, amazing designs for a, <laughs> for a, a, a flyer or announcement, but um, we are giving, um, we are going to be having a vaccine booster clinic. Well, I should say, a vaccine clinic in general, because even if you are uh, have never been vaccinated at all, uh, you can still come to this clinic. But the New Mexico Department of Health is partnering with the Health and Human Services Department to offer an on-site vaccination clinic on May 14th. So in a couple of weeks from now, between one and three, we will be having a an on-site vaccine clinic for anybody who would like to get their first shot second shot third shot fourth shot or 
if you're immunocompromised and you need to get additional doses, it is available. Uh, it will be available to anyone who is in need. So if you have not yet um, received your, your vaccine or your booster, you can contact us. And if you didn't, know, didn't notice on the vaccine incentive flyer, the uh, deadline for your for this to meet the, the eligibility for the vaccine is May 31st. So it will be an opportunity for anyone who needs to get that third shot to come down and get their shot to be eligible for the um, the, the incentive uh, by May 31st. So contact us and get your name on the list. We have not started registering folks yet, but you can contact us and let us know that you're interested in getting vaccinated and we can get you set up and ready to go. Um, so Renee, you have this question. So um, the time frame between boosters is, is uh, four months and um, it used to be five months. They said in the beginning it was five months, but now the eligibility between booster shots is four months now. Um, now, if a person has specific underlying conditions, there are some recommendations for immunocompromised individuals that you'll, you'll need to talk to your doctor about. But the standard uh, time frame between booster shots is four months. Uh, a minimum of four months. I hope that answers your question. All right, so we're at six minutes to closure and I know there are some other um, reports that need to be made. Um, before we get off the uh, off of the live stream. So does anyone else, anyone in the department have any HHS specific updates they want to put out there? Troy, this is Thelma. I just want to let everybody know and it's placed in the bulletin that we're planning to have a Women's Health Week celebration. Women's Health Week, um, it, we're going to be celebrating a couple weeks after because we have some stuff going on. So it'll be on Wednesday, May 18th, um, over here at the um, Senior Center living room area. Uh, we'll be doing a walk. We'll also have a continental breakfast and Mr. Troy Campbell will be presenting us with a um, mental health presentation. So if you all are available, please um, come by and, and join us on Wednesday 18th and it'll be, it is in the um, tribal bulletin that will be going out. Good luck. Um, I'd like to also add that I've been working on a few things with um, our Healthy Kids Healthy Coordinator and then also um, Raven um, to put together um, a food demonstration and probably the first, I believe it's the 5th of May. So we'll have a food demonstration um, just really highlighting um, and nutrients that are important um, for those who may be struggling with osteoporosis or arthritis. Um, May is National Osteoporosis and National um, Arthritis Month. So those um, conditions I wanna highlight and provide some information and then also um, just a small demonstration on nutrition um, rich foods and then also will have kind of a small um, physical activity following that event. So those are in the works um, from, from our department. Can I go next? Um, hi guys, I just want to let you guys know that May is also National Bike Month and what we like to see you guys is either bike or walk to school and work. Um, you know, this is a family 
thing you can do together. Um, you know, everybody, if you want to walk to your friend's house or go walk to check the mail, just get out there and get walking. Uh, get your bikes out, get your your walking shoes, and just try to get those steps in for the month of May. And that's about it. Thanks, Victoria. Anybody else have anything? I wanted to remind everyone that uh, we do have a, a community health assessment that is in progress right now um, to try to identify some of the strengths and needs in the community that we need to try to identify um, for, you know, to help guide us uh, in the future um, for the services that the Health and Human Services Department and the tribal administration can be able to can provide for health and human service related um, uh, services. And I just wanted to put up here the tribal uh, council resolution that was passed on March 24th, basically not only supporting, but, you know, giving us authorization to, to do this um, community health assessment because it's extremely important. There are a lot of conversations that are had with community members talking about uh, why we don't have certain services and what, when are we going to be able to provide specific services uh, for members of the community um, of all age groups, all demographics. Uh, and a lot of it is because we don't have the funding or we don't have the, uh, so the information to support um, starting or or uh, beginning any types of programs that the community needs and in the 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 community health assessment it does mention some of the concerns that have been brought up in the past um, we had a community health assessment back in 2015 and of course they're supposed to be done every four years and here we are seven years after the fact and we don't have a good understanding of the services that the community needs and the community health assessment is a way that we can get that that information identified and the funders the people who we request money for or money from to provide these services whether it's federal government private companies or, or private funding options or state government, they need data. They need information that's going to support the request that we make. This community health assessment is literally the only way that we can get the information that we need to support a request that we make to any of these funding sources. And uh, I would like to say that, you know, it, it's it's easy to get it from other places, but it's not, you know, tribal uh, data sovereignty is is an important piece of, of you know, a being a sovereign nation. And uh, that information is not available in public, publicly accessible areas um, like cities and counties and states have. So the only way that we can get this information is through the people who own the information, which is you all, the community. So the community health assessment will consist of a survey. Um, LaDon has already completed quite a few um, key informant interviews of, of certain individuals in the community. And we also are planning on having some, some focus groups, meetings um, to talk to specific age groups in the community that, that can discuss some of the uh, needs and strengths in the community and where we can go forward to try to help uh, provide these services for those who are in need. So we are planning on having tentatively it's scheduled for May 14th. It's a Saturday where we're going to uh, offer uh, an opportunity for individuals to complete a questionnaire or survey and there will be an incentive that's attached to that. Um, you will get a $50 gift card for completing your survey. And we'd like to have at least 100 of those people, 100 of those surveys answered from members of the community. We would love to have everyone about over the age of 18 answer it. But if we don't get that, you know, we want a minimum of 100 because 
you know, we talk about the population of, of Sanai and the number of people who responded in the 2015 community health assessment. There were only 55 people who responded. So that is not a good representation of the information uh, or sub the information to support um, what the community is in need of and what uh, challenges that might be there. So look out for the invitations look out for the opportunities to come in and provide your input because your input is the only thing that matters. Community health assessments are based on what the community needs, not what Health and Human Services thinks you need or what IHS thinks you need or the Tribal Administration thinks you need. It's going to be based on what you actually need. So these community health, these, uh, the process of the community health assessment is extremely important. It's going to drive what we are going to do and for service that we're going to provide for the next four years. Well, four years because we're going to do another one in four years. <laughs> so um, please, if you uh, can have conversations with everybody in your family, all the members in the community over the age of 18 who have um a desire to make sure that we do what's right for the community to provide specific services, whether it's substance use or mental health services or, uh, you know, generational trauma issues, COVID-19, these community health assessments are going to identify all of those things. And we really would like to have as much participation as possible. So keep a lookout, air out, eye out, for all these different opportunities that you're going to have to, to be able to give your input. And we would definitely appreciate it. I'm sure the entire community would appreciate everyone being able to give their input. So um, that's all I have. Do you have anything to add on that, Rebecca and, and LaDawn, since you're part of the process? Um, I don't have anything to add just um, um, community participation is important this is as mentioned um, your opportunity to provide us with that, the, the information so that we're able to kind of support and guide and help in, in the best way that we can so yeah this is just a just to let the community know Come on out, participate. I'm pretty excited. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for um, for identifying things that um, will be helpful and useful uh, for the community. And um, you know, I um, I think I think that's a really great thing. So I'm hoping everybody comes out, um, participates, um, sends in, you know, their surveys in whichever format we ultimately develop, uh, you know, distribute that in. And um, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, what uh, what it reveals and what we can we can do to um, to make this the to make things uh, you know more make things even better than they already are. So. And I wanted to make sure I had one final thing. All the information that you provide is confidential. <laughs> Some folks are worried about where is this information going to go. No one will have access to this except for those who are involved in the project currently. Um, and your survey will not have your name on it. It will not have any identifying information on it. Everything that you put on there is going to be completely confidential. In fact, when we're done with the information, we're done with these surveys, it'll be stored with Aztec um, to make sure that no one in the Pueblo has any access to it and you won't be, they won't be able to identify who you are. So just, you know, if you were worried about that or you're concerned about who's going to have access to it, no one, no one in HHS, no one in the tribal administration, uh, it will be completely confidential. Uh, the only way that the information will be shared if you get permission to share it, but I don't know if anybody wants to do that. So it's basically going to be an agreement between you, um, the community health assessment uh, 
team and Aztec was going to store it in a secure location and they don't even have opportunity to know who the people are. So um, I, I, I know I'm repeating myself and saying this over and over and over again. I'm just trying to express how important it is for this to be done. Um, it's been a long time. Um, a lot of uh, places across the country have benefited from the funding sources that are out there because they have the data to support it and all the other communities around us who have behavioral health teams and uh, gyms and, and wellness centers and all these different services, they got that funding because they had data to support what they asked for. And so we need this data to support what we ask for. So that's my last appeal <laughs> to the community to please, all the information that we can get from you is going to be appreciated. So that is all I have. Um, does anybody have anything before we go? Victoria? Sorry guys, I forgot to mention that uh, we're still conducting uh, fitness assessments for any individuals that are interested to coming to get that done. And that way you guys can get your membership to uh, Anytime Fitness. So come and get it done. Thanks. Hawaii Wellness Center is coming soon, just so you know. They're saying that the contract's going to be done, so that'll be a third gym that's available. So um, those of you who want to swim and do those different types of things and want to wait, that's fine. But at least get your application in, because if you get your application in, we can have it on file and get you prepared and ready to do that. So thank you all. Anybody else? Rebecca? Claudia? Hold on. No, I don't have anything. I, I'm frozen, so that's why I'm not moving. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. All right. Thank you all. All of you who tuned in, all of you who are going to watch this later on, please leave your comments, questions in the in the comment section. Uh, we will respond to them if they come in later on. Uh, don't think that just because we are not live that we are not going to get your information and be able to respond to uh, the questions you might have. So, Adam. Whether it's on YouTube or it's on Facebook, it doesn't necessarily matter. We monitor it all the time. Put your questions and comments in and we'll respond to it. Remember, you can contact us anytime, 505-252-5986. We appreciate it. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.